So, Hannah, where and when were you born? I was born in Victoria, August 26, 2003. I love Victoria. I love the Empress Hotel. I love the those beautiful gardens. They're the, some of the best. How do you pronounce it? Bouc Bouchard. Bouchard. Yes. Have you have you been able to spend time there and love it? I have actually. Last year, right now due to COVID, um, I'm at a boarding school in Victoria right now, and um, we can't leave the campus. Oh, but gosh. last year I went there a lot and I really enjoyed it. How is that not being able to leave campus? It's like being in jail. <laughs> Oh. It's a, yeah, it's a little bit claustrophobic sometimes. Actually, over this weekend, I'm really excited. For the first time in about two months, I'm going to be able to leave campus and go to a blockade for the Ferry Creek watershed. Um, they're trying to log there, so mm -hmm. I'm really excited for that opportunity. Great. Um, let's do a little bit about your background before we get into um, specific activism. Uh, where are you in school? What what are you what subjects do you like to study? Um, I go to a, a international boarding school, part of the UWC movement right now. Um, originally I'm lived my whole life in Haiti Wai, but when I was born they didn't have a very good um, hospital. So that's why I was born in Victoria, but I've always been from Haiti Wai. Um, and but being at this international boarding school uh, has really like broadened my horizons and my interests of um, like international political issues. Um, right now, my favorite classes I would have to say are philosophy and global politics. Um, oh, that's, and that's cool that you you have access to that. Yeah, they're really amazing classes, and I am just looking forward to um, my university application process right now. So it's an exciting time in my life. So are you a junior? Uh, senior. Ah, senior. And where would your ideal university choice be? Um, I'm not entirely sure. I'm a very indecisive person. Um, I want to be able to focus on um, ecology, but also some sort of intersectionality with um, working for um, like environmental kind of justice and as it intersects with racial justice and um, kind of all of the philosophy and political um, undertones of the, these movements. And also, I'm if I stay in Canada for university, I'm also considering working in linguistics for my indigenous language, Haida because um, there are very few fluent speakers, around 20, and it's very um, kind of essential in my life that we revitalize this language. Could you say a little bit for us in Haida so we can just get a taste of how it sounds? Um, yeah, for sure. I, um, um, Hana Hinidikian, Chizkitne Studiesgog, Haidegwai Studiesgog. That was just kind of an introduction of myself, and um, we, I'm a member of the Chitskitne clan of the Haida Nation, um, and I learned a lot of Haida from my awa, from my mother, um, as it's been kind of her full-time job to teach the language for a while now, so I'm really so like inspired by learning the language from her and also from elders in my life. Did your mother grow up speaking it, or was it something she politically gravitated to as, as an important issue? Um, it's No one kind of in my parents' generation was able to grow up speaking it due to um, boarding schools. Canada's, Canada's um, cultural genocide. And so even for my father's generation, there were very few, like, el there's a lot more elders that they had the opportunity to learn from. But now as I grow up, the elders, um, there are less than 20, so it's even more difficult. But my mother, did, like, learned a lot. Um, you have to kind of actively, like, seek out opportunities to learn the language. You cannot just, just learn it without that. Right. Uh, you, I read, were 
kind of an activist since you could walk or before. So what, what kind of activities did your parents raise you participating in? Well, we grew up in this culture of like, we protect our land on Heidi Wide, even though um, that land is like, we have an island of about um, four, like about a million hectares, which is about the size of Jamaica. There's about 5,000 people living on it. And we have, as the Haida Nation, we were, the government of Canada like stated that we have a very small amount of this land. However, um, we have like a lot more than they realize, like, like the whole island belongs to the Haida Nation, but under Canadian law, they do not recognize that it is all Haida land. So it is very difficult for our law and like our priorities for um, logging and for infrastructure and for like trophy hunting for bears to take precedence when legally white or um, companies don't have to follow it. So we have pretty much my whole life been protecting our island because that's like simply the only thing to do. And it is our island even though Canada doesn't recognize that. Um, so I've been like protesting, um, it's not exactly protesting because if you're protesting you're going against, like you're like protesting a law, right? But we are simply instating our own laws and like just doing what we have the right to do. So it's more blockading or land defending is how we would say it. Um, I just kind of grew up hearing the vernacular protesting so it's sometimes a bit difficult to get out of that. Anyway, so I remember when I was very little, like, you sit around like these fires as everyone's demonstrating and hold up and make signs for, um, like, against um, oil tankers coming near our waters, against logging in my communities, and um, also against uh, trophy hunting for bears which we accident actually um, got banned on the island, which is really nice because bears are very important and um, I think it's not respectful. Are, are Haida people mainly fisher people or wh what's the main way of learning earning a living on the islands? Um, it's actually very much changing recently. Um, traditionally we are we fish and um, right now like a big um, market is tourism, artists, my whole extended family are artists and we still like fish and that's still a really big um, earning but there's also logging industry, um, tourism industry and stuff. But there's also like a really big unemployment um, rate. I think a couple of years ago it was about 70%. I don't know what it is now. Um, so that also affects the way we live and the way our communities work. In a lot of First Nations and Native American areas with high unemployment and economic tragedy, people turn to drugs and alcohol. And it, it's kind of a ubiquitous problem. And I, I wonder if it's true for Haida Nation as well. We have had struggles with that due to it was the only available form of self-medicating from residential schools um, and like there was kind of a taboo about talking about it and no support kind of um, from like white society and all you could do was have that um, drugs and alcohol to self-medicate so that kind of leads to it being a problem with it in the community. Um, and is, are people forming self-help groups or is there some kind of way to organize and give youth support so they don't turn to that same way of self-medicating? Yeah, there is a lot of support for youth within the community. Um, that's something that is really has been really like um, influential. Um, and there's like a lot of like 
respect for youth and people who will who fight for like youth rights in a really powerful way and empower youth and um, I think that just says a lot about our society like the value place and like honor placed upon like youth and elders that I haven't seen so much when living within kind of a more Western Canadian society it hasn't been the same amount of like honor on youth or old people or elders which is um, has been hard to get used to. Hmm. Uh, I know, like, it's not just about keeping youth away from drugs and alcohol, it's like introducing them to the culture and helping us rediscover our culture, which is so, so healing. And um, personally, I found so much adult support in helping me get access to justice. Like, I'm suing the Canadian government for their actions regarding climate change on me. And, um, like, so much of my activism is because Haida Gwaii has so many, like, powerful um, activists for climate justice because the Indigenous voice is such an important one in the climate justice fight. Um, I went to the United Nations Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues in 2019, and we were heard that 5% Indigenous people are 5% of the world's population and have claims to 25% of its land mass. And on that 25% is 80% of the world's biodiversity. Like, indigenous peoples, um, kind of, the importance of um, the land within, like, kind of every aspect of our culture is why it is so necessary that we're at the forefront of this fight. Um, and we aren't just saving the land for ourselves and our culture. We're doing it for everyone, for um, white people too right. and yeah so like being in a place where I could constantly like learn from incredible activists like uh, Severin Suzuki um, like who spoke at the United Nations when she was 12 years old um, like my grandfather Gu Zhao who just like amazing leaders and elders and being able to learn so much from them and like draw so much inspiration from their work and from elders work is really just like another way that the community supports you. So it's not just through preventing um, drug and alcohol. Like the like we the youth are supported in so many ways, and I really admire that about my community. Some indigenous people have a tradition of that we have to think in terms of the seven generations, the three that were before us that we can learn from and support us now, and the three ahead of us. Is that part of your cultural background, too? We have to think of the seven generations. Um, I am not entirely sure if that was, like, historically our cultural um, background, like the, that exact wording. However, it, that is always, like, kind of what you're told is you have to do, like, using the what you do, using the wisdom of your ancestors and looking forward and doing what is best for. I think, like, the way I've heard it was, like, seven generations behind and seven generations in the forward. So, like, 14, 15 generations total. Um, not just the next three. Like, kind of, you're taught to appreciate all that your ancestors have done for you and you learn that that's what they, their like mindset was and their goals was was making the world the amazing place that it is for you and for your generation and ones after that and so you like I learned so much from my land and my culture and so much that just barely escaped um, the escaped from cultural genocide and assimilation. And so I have like a responsibility so that future generations also can learn from our land and have access to it the way I did because they have the right to that. It's, and it's what like all of these generations of our ancestors have been fighting for. That's kind of the mindset to it. And I think also the idea is often, it's not just the ancestors our past and our history it's that, that we can call on them and they can empower us and teach us now from spirit world it is does that resonate with what you've been taught that ancestors are 
a source of power now? Um, yes, they really are. And you could really see it so much, and they're so, like, connected to the land as well, like that spiritual aspect of our um, living. And so, like, environmental activism and protecting our land isn't just about protecting, like, the local ecology or the work it's doing for people. It's the way my grandfather put it is we, the Haida Gwaii, our land doesn't belong to us. We belong to our land. Like, every aspect of our art and our spirituality and the way we live and communicate comes from relationship with land. And that's why it's such an important aspect of kind of everything. Health. <laughs> Um, spirituality, ancestors. Yeah, that's just my understanding, though, as a as a young person. I am um, really not an expert. Um, the the Native Americans in my area in Northern California don't think that it's accurate to say there was a migration over the Bering Street Strait and then they came down. They think they their origin was from this place and they didn't migrate. W what have you heard about the origins of the Haida people? Um, the origins of people are actually, it's such a politicized question, oh. the anthropology of it. Like, I know in the past they've been kind of trying to dis, um, like, disvalue indigenous people based on how long they've been on the land. Um, like, oh, you guys are kind of immigrated here too. I know from our origin story they say we sprung up out of the sea, um, to our land, um, and that kind of, we, like, were helped by, uh, the raven. Origin stories have such, like, an important impact on the way that people view the world, I think, so it's, I think that's such an interesting thing to learn about. Mm -hmm. Um, but, I mean, sprung out of the sea, like, that can be interpreted so many different ways. It's, like, that we came from the sea, that could be Bering Strait. I really am not an expert on it, especially, I know, like, um, like the latest archaeological, archaeological evidence of um, people on Haida Gwaii is about 14,000 years. So everyone kind of immigrated to wherever they are, like, um, mostly everyone except for um, Africa, but... It's not that, that doesn't mean that that's not where we were always from. That's kind of our view of time, like a always thing. And if it's 14,000 years, I think that counts as always. Um, and there are places on Haida Gwaii that um, weren't hit by the last ice age. Like there's this certain type of, type of tree that, uh, or not tree, like flower, that you get on top of the tallest mountains, and their closest relatives are on mountains in China because everywhere else it was wiped out by the Ice Age. So, um, like, I think it's possible that we've been here from before then and, like, survived the Ice Age. Hmm. Um, what kind of ceremony were you raised with growing up? And I know that cedar bark is an important part of the culture and ceremony, but it's, it's under assault by development, so... What kind of ceremony was supportive to you, is supportive? Um, I didn't work within a uh, family, like um, stories and songs and um, feeding the fire, um, giving food to the ancestors through the fire, that type of thing. Um, cedar bark is such an integral, like, foundation to every part of the community, like, it's what you would make everything out of, like, the boats, the houses, the, um, everything, and, yeah, spiritually is also important, and, like, hemlock was used for, like, cleansing and that kind of thing, um, however, I... I didn't, yeah, there's, 
I don't, as a youth, I'm not really sure what I have the authority authority to talk on spiritual spirituality wise, because it is such a kind of elder reliant thing, and um, like in the Haida culture, you don't really ask why for things. You just listen to stories, and if you just listen to them again and again, you like know the places they're talking about. Like eventually, like when you're older, you come to understand them but um like culturally like I, I don't have that kind of understanding over my culture where I feel like I'm the authority to talk about it to people who don't know about it um yeah that, which is something I've had to learn because I I go to an international school where a lot of people didn't even know there were indigenous people in um North America and <laughs> no one knew about the Haida so I'd be like trying to teach about my culture but also like there's I don't know what like, I can teach about and how to teach it in a way where I don't represent, misrepresent anything. And I feel like spirituality is one of the most, um, the places where I feel least comfortable kind of going and talking about, if that makes sense. Yes. The, um, the young people who led the Standing Rock Sioux protests against the, the pipeline came into conflict with the elders because traditionally young people weren't supposed to initiate and be leaders it was really elder based and the elders were upset at first about all the that the young people had organized at Standing Rock and places like that so I wonder if that's been your experience or if it sounds like you you felt really supported in your activism Yes, I feel like elders have really supported my activism. I think a really good example of like the relationship with elders and um, leadership comes from a uh, protest or a blockade, a stand that happened in the 1980s on Haiti Gwai called Ashley Gwai or Lyle Island, um, where the young people the young men, like my grandfather, he was kind of young at the time, um, were willing to kind of risk it all, to risk their lives, everything, to protect the bottom half of Haile Gwai, which is full of like mortuary groves and um, like sacred old village sites and uh, like thousand year old trees. And it's a very important place to our people. They wanted to start logging down there mm. and um, Young people decided they had enough with logging without consultation, that this is our island and that we got to control the industry here and the protection of this island. And the young people were willing for it to get violent, like if it had to. They were willing to do whatever it took to save our land. Like they wouldn't start it getting violent, but they were willing to, to fight and to be there and to do whatever they could to protect the land. And then, like without being asked, or anything, the elders came and they were like, we're old, like, if I'm like 80 and I'm arrested, it will impact my life less than if like, you were arrested, like 20, you know? Um, and they also had like, such a strength and an impact to have the elders there and protesting in their nonviolent way. And when um, the police were involved to arrest elders, like, like, some policemen, like, you have to arrest your like, Grandma, like someone you grew up with, like around, and that is really hard. And when you look at it in the media, seeing that the old people were the ones being like, we had to be here. If anyone's going to be arrested, it's us. If you see that in the news, like the police, like having to brutally arrest a drag away a really old woman who like deserves so much respect, that really did something. That really helped get our um, situation to higher priority, so which led us to the Guayanas Agreement, where um, like the land we were worried about became both a Haida heritage site and um, Canadian national park. If it was just became a Canadian national park, we would have had to give up sovereignty to it. But the first page of the Guayanas Agreement is the Haida acknowledge that this is Haida land. The Crown acknowledges this is Crown land. Though we disagree, we're going to work together to protect it. You know? Mm -hmm. None of that would have been possible if the elders weren't the ones to take that stand. 
I don't know if that answers your question. But yeah, yeah. I'm just thinking of that, um, like, the that's kind of a, a common tactic, like it's happening now in... Um, in Bosnia that you you put the women and grandmothers and people that the police don't really want to have conflict with in front of the of the protest lines the demonstration lines and it it works it's 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 it it calm it calms things down um just a few things more about your background do you have siblings i do actually have two two younger siblings a younger brother and a younger sister 12 and um 8 Ouija and Nora Jane. And are they being following in your footsteps and being activists as well? Um, they're doing their own pretty incredible things. My sister it, and my brother both love like their own types of art. My sister is, make, is making like face masks and giving them out for free to people and loves to make dresses and um, is interested in activism, especially like um, working as I did before I left to ban plastic bags and Heidi Gwai. Um, but very much in her own very creative way. Um, and my, my brother, the same thing. He's super into animals and um, like learning about different animals. So I think that will serve him well in the future, but he also loves to make comic books, and he's a really good artist, and he loves to carve, like my dad, so. Ah, creative yeah. family. Well, very different, in, and are working for kind of the same thing in different ways. Got it. Many paths to the same mountaintop. And what are three words to describe you for someone who doesn't know you? How do I know who Hana is? Um, I have to say Haida. It's such an integral part of my identity. So Haida, um, I guess determined and respect. I really value respect. So I'm respectful. That's the thing Like I try and be the most. Mm -hmm. um, let, let's go over some of your uh, specific contributions that you've made. You, you founded um, Damien Taiji, I don't know how to pronounce mm -hmm. it, a, a youth organization to protect the environment. Pronounce it properly for me. Um, I founded the monthly. And what, how old were you and what was your purpose and how has it developed? Um, I think I was about 14 or 15. Um, and I founded this because so many people in Haida Gwaii were interested in um, supporting um, protecting our land, but there wasn't really an avenue for youth to do that, and so I thought this would be an amazing way for people like us to work together to do what we felt was needed for environmental protection. So we like promoted reusable bag options in lieu of plastic bags. Um, did a school strike and um, helped um, get funding and, and stuff. So our science teacher and science department could get a machine that turns plastics into fuel for the school. Um, do you have class in three minutes? What is this? No. Pardon? I do have class in three minutes and I'm very sorry about the timing thing. No problem. Um, okay, let me 